All right, so lambdas, uh, lambdas and functions. Um, what are lambdas? Uh, lambdas are nameless functions, right? Are functions that do not have a name, they are created on the fly and you can uh, use them. Uh, created on the fly is, uh, is what they appear to be. Uh, they are defined as variables and you can use them as variables and you can, and they will go out of scope uh, as variables, but um, you, you should not be um, uh, under the impression that they are actually runtime objects. They are compile time uh, functions like any other function. And actually you could see, you could interpret a Lambda as a, just as a function object. So a function object for who uh, is not familiar with the concept it, or functor is a, it, it is a class that has the function call operator defined. So once you construct your object of that class, um, you can call, you can use that object as a, as a function. So you can call that function, you can invoke that object as a function. Um, and so the um, syntax for a Lambda is a little bit um, weird maybe because it starts with the uh, square brackets, and in this case, it is empty, right? It's a very basic lambda. It says empty square brackets. It has the list of arguments of this function, and then the body of the function. In this case, it should be pretty obvious. Takes two integer arguments and return the sum of the two integers. So, and then I can call my function f, my lambda, with two arguments, and I get the result back and I can assign it to a variable. Uh, why is this useful? Well, lambdas are useful in many cases, in many circumstances, actually. They are extremely powerful tools. And they, in, in this very simple example, you have a vector, for instance, and you want to uh, iterate over that vector and increment every value in this vector. Be before lambdas, you would have to define a function somewhere or a function object somewhere outside uh, of your scope. And you define the function, then you can access it, right? Then you can call it. And this creates a little bit of uh, uh, decoupling say between the code that you read and, and what the code is doing, because what the code is doing is defined somewhere else, either in your file or in some other file. While in this case, you can define what's happened uh, just directly in your code. So it, is, uh, it makes the code uh, more uh, readable. And in, in this case, for instance, you get this Lambda that takes a reference to a value uh, and then increments that value. So this for each, every time that it, it, it enters into one of these uh, elements of these vectors, dereference it and pass the value, pass the reference to the value to this function. So now we just, and, and then th th this function simply increments it. So uh, the mental model that, uh, again, for me, this, this is how I, I work. I need to understand how things could work in principle. Uh, you can see a Lambda like, like this one to be transformed into, into a function object. In this case, uh, I call it a struct, which has some name and, uh, and where you take the argument lists uh, of this Lambda and, uh, you put that that argument list to, to, as argument list to the to the function call operator. Um, the body of the lambda becomes the body of the function call op operator. The name is uh, uh, defined by the compiler, and um, what you what you have is that uh, um, you can see here that. The, the type of this F, right, this auto, is basically the name of this uh, struct. And uh, it, since it has to be 
uh, so since it is defined by the compiler, uh, you you don't have an option here to specify the type of the uh, of this lambda. This, this lambda has basically to be auto. You, <clears throat> the return type also is is auto here, but it could be that used to be integer. It's just because the language allows you to deduce the, the return type of your functions, so you don't have to specify the type here. And, and another interesting, important point is that is this const here. So the function call operator is const, which means uh, it, the, the, this function is not allowed to change the, the state of the object itself. So this function operator uh, cannot change in, in any way this uh, struct internal state. So, uh, when we say the, the the function operator cannot modify the, the state, is because it can have a state. And um, what in in this example we see uh, how how to give state to your uh, to to your lambda. Um, in this case, we, inside the square bracket that, that that we saw before, we put the name of of a variable which is in this scope. In this case, t. And uh, inside of the body of the function, we can use T and use it for, for its operation. Uh, this is called uh, capture by value, which means at this time, at this place here, you make a copy of this, of this variable value here, uh, and then you use the same name, but it's actually a different variable, right? So it is a different thing if you, um, and you are actually not allowed to change the value of this t inside of your of your lambda. How, how is that? Uh, how is that uh, um, achieved? Well, if we go to our mental model, we can see that when we capture t, uh, this basically become uh, a member function of this function object, which is initialized to the value of the variable at the time of the invocation, which means that now if my function is actually con, my function call operator is const, I cannot change the value of, of this data member, right? Because it is written, uh, because it, it, it is inside a const member function, which means it can, I cannot change the, the state. Well, if I want the, the state to change, I can uh, by adding the keyword mutable between the argument list and the body of my lambda. Uh, the mutable then becomes like the mutable keyword in classes and structs. It's not the keyword that is used very often and, uh, and it shouldn't be used very often actually, uh, but in in this in, in in this case, we capture we we capture the value eight into t, and this becomes the initializer for this member uh, of, of our of our lambda. But this member is indicated as mutable, and when you have a data member which is mutable, it can be modified also when uh, when you do the um, uh, even if the if even if the member function is defined const i see that there is a typo here this should be this t plus plus should also be repeated here in, in, from c plus plus for 14 we have uh, um, uh, generic lambdas where you you can have where the type of the arguments can be left uh, unspecified. So in this case, if I, instead of specifying the, the type of my argument, I put in front auto, then when I call it F, when I call F with 45 and 4.67, the types will be deduced to be uh, an integer for the first argument and a double for the second one. The return type is also deduced, which means that in this case, the return type will be uh, double because the integer will be upcasted to the double. 
so mental model again uh these auto arguments become basically template arguments so that every time i call my member function the compiler will generate an instantiation for the proper types that i'm passing to it every time i call the member function with different types so there's no mystery uh, here how thing works it's simply that um yeah it becomes a like a template member function uh we can also uh rename the variables inside of our uh, body of our function for instance you can say i have a, a boolean here uh but i want to use a different name within my body uh, and and so now i do flag equal sum this is captured by value and, and you give a different name so now inside the body of my lambda i can use this uh, uh, flag <laughs> and uh yeah and it is my this might be useful well you can basically have your body of the lambda to make more sense to you or maybe you are uh, cut and paste code from from somebody else and put it put it inside the lambda uh, and you and you want to change the name of a variable in this case that's also quite clear what happens how this could be implemented you basically this become the uh, flag become the data member and we initialize it in the constructor of, of our lambda with the value of uh, of sum in this case when when we pass sum when, when we construct our our lambda <clears throat> um the capture list could be uh uh uh, no, so you can capture um, the variables of your uh, environment in different ways. So we saw the capture by value. So you 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 get the value of of a variable at the point of instantiation of your lambda, but you can also capture a variable by reference. And to do so, you need to put the reference symbol before the variable that you're capturing and also in this case mental model simple yeah this becomes a reference data member uh of your of, of, of your struct so when you construct your um your your lambda uh, the second argument is an interf and you just assign the reference so this becomes a reference to to x and and, and of course you have to be careful when you do this because uh the, the lifetime of this of this uh, reference should be shorter than the life, lifetime of this variable so if you if you are passing the lambda somewhere and this variable x goes out of scope then of course you lose the reference uh, you then you're pointing to basically to garbage on the stack what if i want to i what if i'm I'm a little lazy and I want to capture everything and I want to capture everything by by reference right uh, so I have two variables here sum and x and I don't want to write explicitly the capture for all of those variables I want to capture everything that is in that that is around uh, and everything by uh, by reference well I put inside the square bracket I put just the reference symbol and in this case all the variables that are in my environment will be captured and will be um and and will be uh placed as data as reference data members of my of my functor but i can also capture everything by value by putting equal inside the square bracket i capture every single variable uh the, in my environment by value now to keep the same code as the as the previous slide like here um i i put also the keyword mutable here so that i will have mutable data members 
So the same code will work. Otherwise, clearly, if I didn't put the mutable keyword that will have compiler error when I try to assign to sum and assign to seven. But it must be clear that the behavior of these two versions, the version with the ampersand and the version with the equal sign are, are totally different. In this case, I'm actually modifying Right. When I call my lambda, I actually modify the um, uh, the um, values of the of, of the variable in my in my scope. So after I call my lambda, this is not the calling the lambda; it's just defining. But uh, for instance, I can do like this. Wait a second, uh, which is also nice to see the syntax. If I'm calling my lambda now in line, uh, which is also fine. Uh, where is it? Uh, if, if I'm calling my, my lambda online here, uh, at the end, after my lambda, these values will be, will, will be something else, right? My sum and my x will be uh, different, and x will be equal to, equal to 7, these x after, after the call. But in this case, after the call, if I call f as many times as I want, x is never changed because f is always 42, even, even if I call it, because what I'm changing is not this x, but the data member x inside of my uh, function object here. <clears throat> we can also uh, capture everything except uh, we want to capture something else in a different way. For instance, I want to capture sum by value and x. Uh, I want to capture everything by value, but I want to capture x uh, by uh, by reference. So this is also allowed by the by the language. Um, there is a, a, an additional um, uh, issue, which is the return type of uh, of my of my lambda. So if for some reason my lambda is such that the return type cannot be easily deduced or cannot be deduced by the compiler, uh, we can specify that the return type uh, explicitly. For instance, we put after, after the argument list. So this one is a lambda that takes a complex and returns the same returns the same complex. Uh, now, um, so it's basically making a copy. Uh, now I can specify that I want to return a complex type. And you can say by putting this arrow and, and specifying the type of the return type. So when you do like this, then you it's always yeah, the, the return type is specified here. Uh, this might be useful not just to determine to just impose what the return type of the lambda is, but also to if you want to return, for instance, a reference as a return type. And in this case, you might want to say, well, I want to return the auto ref, which is taking the type auto, the type that you will return from the function and appending a, re a reference to it. For instance, in this case, I'm passing two, uh, um, two complex numbers, um, and I call my lambda sum in place, where I will return the new value. But I also, this return value is actually a, a, re a reference to the, to the first argument. It's, it's not a, a good example, I say, it's kind of weird, but it, it allows you to basically control what the return types are in your functions. <clears throat> a, a nice feature of lambdas is that they are convertible to function pointers. So you can, if you have a, a run uh, method that, um, um, takes a function pointer. In this case, it's a function that takes two integers and, and uh, return another integer. 
you can call this, uh, this run function directly with a lambda. So you can put a lambda here, a function that performs the, the sum of two numbers and you pass it in and, and it, it will work. This assert here is to be, you want to be sure that the function pointer is pointing to something. It's not a null pointer. And so uh, this code will actually work. In a different context, when you want to use Lambda uh, inside of your, uh, your member functions, um, you have to be a little bit careful. Um, or you want to return a lambda from <coughs> from, a, from a function uh, from a member function, for instance. Uh, in this case, let's look what happens. So we have a, this function object here, and this function object is uh, um, has a data member a, which is an integer, and uh, the function call operator as a, defines a lambda in there that capture everything by value and then access uh, that as an in, um, defines a variable a and then print a uh, i mean increment this a and print a right so this one and then calls my, uh, my uh, calls this lambda in this case of course the output will be always one because this variable is shadowing the data member. So it's basically overimposing itself over the data member. I, so we need to understand what capturing means in this case. So we have an alternate function here that doesn't define a new um, variable inside the body of my Lambda, but simply say A plus plus and then prints A. Then what does happen in this case? Well. I'm capturing everything by value. So you might be expecting that I'm since a uh, since the data member a is actually in scope here, you should you could copy a. So this code works, right? This code compiles. But the problem is that what is captured here is not really the data members of this class. What is captured is is uh, this, right? So here you are actually accessing the data member of A, but is that this pointer, which is captured by value, which means that this function modifies the uh, data member here. Let me show you what actually happens. So what actually happens is that the, this pointer, so the pointer that points to the actual object instantiation is copied inside my Lambda, and since I'm not changing those, that pointer cannot be changed because it's copied by value or it cannot, it cannot change, even if it changes, doesn't change the original the pointer, but the data member, the, the, the value which is pointed by that pointer can be modified. So basically you are mod <laughs> modifying the data member inside your, uh, your Lambda. And so in, in this case, you have to be careful um, that when, when, you, uh, yeah, when you act over the data members of, of, uh, of the class and, and you are inside the Lambda, you think, okay, the Lambda makes copies of everything. It's not copying the data members, it's just, giving you access by reference to them so you can actually change them. Uh, let's see another example in which uh, we have a function in which we define the local variable a and uh, we capture everything by value and you still inside you can access your data member like using this uh, a and then you can access the local variable uh, a that you defined in your body straight away. Because this one would actually shadows the data member A, right? So the data member is shadowed inside 
but you can access the data member by explicitly referring to through the pointer uh, to the instance of the of, of the object. And the, the difference again is that this A is, a, is accessible by reference, so you can change the value. And this one is accessed by copy, which means that there's no, um, when, when I call X here, uh, the value of this a will be five because it 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 is the value that happened that was there when the when the lambda was created. This was a little bit of a concern. Uh, there were many codes that were ported from Fortran to C plus plus, for instance, and they wanted to copy the body of the functions and modify them uh, inside these uh, big objects. And uh, this didn't didn't work, right? The, the code didn't work because it was changing the data members all over the place. And so in C17, the a new syntax is actually added. To when you say star this, you copy the content of the class. Basically, the data member of the class that will be available inside of your of your lambda uh, by value. So this a plus plus which is referring to this a is not actually a, re a reference but is a copy so this is safe right you, you can do this kind of uh, um, operation without changing the, uh, the the state of your of your class std function uh, this is a, a nice facility that uh, allows uh, al allows a very flexible way of dealing with different uh, computations at different uh, points. So suppose that um, um, we have a function, uh, um, well, so STD function works like this, right? You, you put the signature of the function that you want your STD function to look like. So I want STD function that is a function that takes an in two integers and returns a float. And I can, for instance, assign uh, a lambda to it. In this case, a lambda that takes two integers and return a float. And, uh, and I simply assign it to it. And this is not the same as the auto that we saw before, right? When we say auto f equal the lambda, the type of the lambda is actually some type that we don't know uh, that is decided by the compiler. and and we, we basically don't know what type is. We can print, we can actually inspect the type name using some uh, techniques, but um, um, but yeah, the, the type is not something that we can actually inspect. In this case, we take whatever Lambda type is and we put it inside this STD function. So now F is of type STD function with this signature and I can take F and call it, right? So I can call my function like it was calling my Lambda before. The difference is now that if I have a function foo that take uh, two arguments, integer and uh, returns a float, then I can retargeting my SED function. Now, when I call F34, I'm not calling my original Lambda anymore, I'm calling this function foo. And I didn't ha have to recreate a new function. I didn't have to uh, create a new variable. I can simply retarget that function to this one. And, uh, and, and this also worked with function objects. So if I have a class that uh, implements the function call operator, then I can simply construct it, assign it to F, and F will be uh, again called with as a function. Right? Uh, this is very very flexible. Uh, the drawback of this flexibility: every time you add flexibility, you have to pay for some price because every invocation of this function is. It, it, um, incur in a virtual function call overhead. Um, the virtual function is for uh, is a function that requires some uh, uh, runtime checks in order to find out which is the actual uh, version of the function that, that that you want to call. So every time you call a function here, 
you pay a little bit of a price to find where the function uh, is, uh, which is usually a table uh, lookup. So it's not many instructions, but if this is inside your hot loops, you know the loops that takes that are the most computational intensive loops, then you you will actually see some uh, uh, slowdown. So you need to be a little bit careful when you want to do uh, this kind of tricks. But you know if the function is, itself is big, so it's not just adding two uh, two numbers, but contains uh, big big loops or heavy computations then this might actually be a good way of having a flexible interface and also uh, good performance. You can also do that with the, there's also a way to do it with the member function. Just, uh, I have just the, an example for this one. You basically you have your class A which has um, this uh, uh, member function that displays uh, things uh, that you pass in. You pass, it's a template function, takes something and basically prints it and assumes it is a number. Now in, in your main, you instantiate an object of type A uh, and now you want to have a function here that you call print num that is a, that 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 is the func it is the member function of this object, and now you say how do you say it is the address of a column column display thing and then the template argument. Of course, if it is not a template function, then uh, you don't have to put the template here. It's just for completeness, and then you can call print num, but you have to pass the object and the um, and the value that you want to display. An important uh, um, thing here we'll see also later is that a member function is, is never a function that takes the arguments that you see here. They take also an additional uh, argument, which is that this pointer. So the first argument of this function actually is the pointer to this uh, um, the pointer to this object, and unless the function, unless the member function is a st a st static, and then it doesn't take that argument. But if it is just a um, member function, you need to know what object you want to call this member function. Goodness, this I mouse is really uh, okay. And so now you can call the print. You can call print num. This is a function that I defined here with the with the object and with the uh, and with the value that I want to print. And a, a nice feature is that it also works natively with uh, unique pointers. So if I have a, a point a pointer to an object of type A, uh, and then I can actually call the um, call my uh, print num with just the pointer. Uh, it, it, I don't have to dereference it. Then this unique pointer you will see in a presentation later. Um, there is another facility uh, in the in the uh, standard library, which is the uh, which is the um, um, bind. So the bind function. Uh, is something that takes a function and can transform it. You can transform the signature of a function uh, and, uh, and see that function through different eyes. Uh, so for instance, in this case, I have a function that takes two integers and uh, returns the difference of the two. Of the two. Uh, in, in this case, I can make this function to look like a, a, a something else. For instance, a function that takes one argument and, and that uh, subtract four every time I call it. So I need to do something special here. I can I need to use the namespace placeholder, placeholders, and then I can do std bind of the function foo, 
where the first argument is a placeholder. In this case, say it is a free argument, right? It's a, underscore one means the first argument of my new function will be placed here. And the second argument to foo will always be four, which means now every time I call my function x, uh, this becomes seven minus four, because the first argument of this function will be placed in the placeholder and the second argument is always four. So now this is equivalent to call foo with four. Uh, if you, if I want to go a little bit more uh, in, if I, I, so I can do more, uh, more transformation. So in this case, the one we saw here, and first placeholder and four, uh, then I, I will have two, for instance, if I pass six, six minus four, but I can also say underscore one, underscore one. So the placeholder, the first argument of my, when I call my, my binded function, the first argument go, goes into both, uh, both arguments. And uh, so in this case, for instance, I obtain zero because it's six minus six. Uh, on the other end, I can also say, well, I want to the second argument that I'm passing in will be placed in both in both arguments. So now I need to pass two arguments because I need to pick the second one, right? And the second one is eight. So this function this function becomes eight minus eight because the number eight is placed. The second argument is placed in, in on both sides. Um, and I, can, and I can, for instance, swap. So I can put the second argument as first argument and, and the first argument as second argument. So this is six, when I call it with six, four, I actually get minus two because the second argument is placed first and the first argument is placed, is placed second. So you can play all these uh, all these tricks here. The interesting part is that this doesn't incur in any function uh, in, in any virtual function or in any overhead, right? This is as fast as you can get. So everything is, is very efficient here. And, and you have less flexibility, but then we will see this, this uh, less flexibility also as implication uh, in the sense that you cannot do certain things. Now, there was a question yesterday. I said, well, what, what if I need to pass a reference? Uh, so in this case, for instance, it, it, my function bar at, at, accepts uh, as input two integers, but not by value, but by reference. So I need to have a variable available, an L value for this guy. Now, if I, if I look here, when I do the bind, I pass the number four, uh, or if I pass even a variable, this will be copied, right? It will assume that it is a copy. So I need to tell my bind that, uh, well, need to be careful, we need to pass reference. So in this case, you put, uh, in, you want to bind to this function that accepts uh, references. So you need to say that the second argument is an std colon column ref x. So x will be, will be binded to the second argument of this uh, function and uh, it, it will be, uh, cap will be basically captured by reference, right? You could pass it, we say this is given to this bind as, as, uh, as reference. Um, in this a silly example, that, that, that's fine. You see, you can bind the first argument of my bar function will be given and I'm passing Y here, I'm calling in place, right? Uh, passing y and the, and the second one is the reference to x. In more um, realistic examples, somehow when my function accepts const reference, because this is a way in which you can pass arguments uh, efficiently, even when they are when they occupy a large amount of memory, you pass them as const reference, then you have to say uh, that, you, that you're passing a const reference to uh, to your variable x. So you have to say std colon column cref 
uh, of X, and CREF stands for const, uh, const reference. And then I call it with six, because now I can call it it's in const reference, I can pass uh, instant values. I can, I can pass our values to this function here. Um, I see the, the uh, target method. Let's go back to the example we had before. And we have a run function that takes a function pointer, int, and uh, that, uh, that, that returns an integer and um, takes two integers uh, as argument, the same code as before. And we have the, also a function foo that we use later. So we, we, as we saw, we can run, we can run with a lambda. So we can call the run function with a lambda and that's totally fine. But if we try to run with the bind of foo uh, with, and with the two arguments, this will not work. All right, so the bind function cannot be converted to a function pointer. You cannot do that. And this is where we say, right, it is fast, but it is not that, it, 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 it is not flexible. So this is, for instance, one typical interface you find in, in, in C. So you want to pass the C pointer uh, to a, a function to a C library, for instance. So in this case, what you can do, uh, well, you can embed your function foo into an std function int, but also running it directly run my f is also not feasible. The std function cannot be automatically converted to a function pointer. Instead, with, with an std function, you need to call the target uh, function where you say my f here, you dot target, and you want the signature of the function pointer that you want back. And, and only in that case, you call it. So you get, and you get the point, you get the pointer to a pointer function, you dereference it, and then you call the function. In this case, this, this will work. If you are passing the wrong type here, so if you're not passing the right uh, target uh, signature to your target function, then the pointer that you get is a null pointer. So for instance, here I'm passing this uh, function that takes a, a reference to a float instead of two integers. It, it, this code compiles and runs. So it will run only that wrong F, it will be the null pointer. So if you try to use it, you, you get a segmentation fault. And, uh, and I wanted to show you how, how STD functions work with, for the case of uh, member functions. The, the reason is that we can understand better uh, what a member function actually is uh, and what the difference between a static member function and a member function. So in this case, we have a, a struct A uh, with data member V and we have two different uh, member functions here, member and member two. And the first one is static. They both take two integers and return an integer. And the first one returns just a constant value. And then the second returns the data member. Of course, from the static data member, uh, from the static function member, you cannot return V. Right? It's not visible in some sense. The static data uh, function member, member function uh, cannot access V. If you try, you get a compilation error. Uh, but for the second one, yeah, it, you, you can do it. So there is a different, there is an intrinsic difference between a static member function and a non-static member function. So if I, it's very, uh, it's very easy to do, to have an STD function uh, out of a static data member, a static member function. You basically say what the signature is, int, int, and then your member one, and then you basically, uh, oh, goodness. And then basically um, you, you give the, 
pointer to this member, you, you give this member function, which is a column column member, right? Which is uh, at the end of the pointer to the member function. And then you might run it. And then uh, if you want to run it using your the function that you had before, this is also uh, something we could do. You take the target out of member one as uh, int star int int, and then we simply run it. We need to dereference it, and then we run it. Um, so you can see that the static member function is basically a regular function. It doesn't have nothing weird. It is a function that takes two arguments and returns an integer like here, it takes two arguments and returns an integer. A static member function, it's basically behaving like a function within a namespace. It's not within, not at really within, uh, uh, within a, 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 a class. But when we move to the second member function, then we see a little bit of a difference. Now, if I want a member, uh, the member function to, um, if, I, if I want, sorry, if I want the STD function to the non static uh, member function, then I have to uh, express my signature of STD function with an extra argument, which is a pointer to, to, to A. And which is uh, the which will be substituted with a, this pointer, right? So the, this pointer is passed as an argument to this function, and then it becomes fundamentally just a function. So member two is just a function that you can um, that you can call with the pointer to the object and the arguments. Right? So this function here is a little bit misleading. You need to have the. Uh, you need to pass this pointer to, to this function. In, in in other languages, this is actually explicit. For instance, in Python, you always have the self uh, here in the in the signature of your member function. But in in C in C++ is not uh, is not uh, visible, even though it's there. And uh, you can also bind into, so for instance, uh, I know that I'm going to call this, mem this thing only with two um, integers. So you can bind now this member two, which is, takes three arguments. You can say, well, the first argument is always the address of this object. And now you can call this as a function. The difference is that you cannot really uh, convert this to a function pointer anymore. It is a bind, so you cannot really pass it to the run function in any way. There's no way for you to call this member, uh, this, this binded member uh, tree function that takes two arguments to, to a, a C, a, as a C pointer. So um, we, we have different ways of treating functions in C++ uh, other than simply writing the functions and the function object, which are, uh, you can do lambdas, which are very, very good ways of uh, keeping your code compact and, con and have everything visible, but also implement uh, different uh, programming styles in which you which these functions are created the say they look like they are created on the fly bind is also is very efficient but it cannot be converted to function pointers and they can be well if you if you just live in the C++ environment it might be actually giving you good uh, interfaces good uh, apis but as this as soon as you move outside, it gets a little bit uh, complicated. And STD functions are very flexible, but they have uh, this runtime um, overhead, so you need to be a little bit careful when you want to use them.